Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, March 6, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. As the saying goes, everything can be done better with a shell script and all it needs for world peace is the right one-liner. Well, Xavier looked at a real neat sort of malicious bash script. In this particular case, of course, we get a crypto coin miner installed. Kind of interesting that they are bothering to actually figure out how many CPUs are running on the system so they can set up the right number of threats. But that's not it. They're also enabling cron jobs and enabling a root back door. Now, as Xavier points out, often the root isn't allowed to log in via SSH, but well, sadly, that's not true a lot of the times. So probably this will work. Interesting also that they're attacking Redis. Redis is yet another one of these memory-based NoSQL databases, somewhat competing with memcached that kept us busy last week. In this case, however, they're not interested in a denial of service attack. Instead, they're trying to use Redis to install malicious code on these remote systems. Now, talking about memcache, the, the denial of service attacks continue to come and continue to get bigger. The latest record, as Arbor reports, it's 1.7 terabits per second. The attack last week with GitHub was 1.3 terabits per second. Now, both numbers come from Arbor, so I think they're somewhat comparable. But as always, with denial of service attacks that are are that large. You'll have to take these numbers with a grain of salt, given that uh, quite often with these large attacks, actually not all of the traffic is detected because it will get blocked rather far upstream to the congestion close to the source of the traffic. And if you're using the popular Java framework Spring Data REST in order to create REST APIs, you may want to double check if you are up to date. The problem here is a remote code execution vulnerability that was fixed back in September last year, but so far we didn't really have a lot of details about it. Last week, the company that discovered the vulnerability did release a little bit more detail about what the vulnerability is actually about. So this is probably going to get the exploit developers going on writing an exploit and scanning for vulnerable systems. So again, this, this has been patched for a number of months now. But you may say, luckily, the company Pivotal behind finding the vulnerability held back in divulging too much details until now to give people a chance to patch. Ironically, it's the patch method that's vulnerable here. So if you're seeing requests with odd JSON content coming in to your REST applications that are using the patch method, well, uh, that's part of where you wanna be a little bit careful. Patch is a normal method for REST APIs. It's a little bit a newer method. I don't see it used a lot, but it's certainly being used and uh, you can't usually just block it if you're using a modern REST API. So in other words, I'm not recommending you block the patch method. I recommend that you pay close attention to these patch requests and definitely make sure that you updated the Java Spring Data REST framework. And of course, we had attacks and tools to attack 3G networks for quite a while now, but most cell phone networks are switching over to LTE. So a lot of the time, attacks now require sort of a downgrade attack first to 3G or even older protocols. Well, it may no longer be necessary. There is an interesting paper that was published by researchers from Purdue University and the University of Iowa. And in this paper, they outline what I would describe as a man in the middle attack against the LTE network. So essentially an attacker can gain a man in the middle position between a phone and a cell tower and then essentially impersonate the phone and inject additional traffic. 
It's a little bit more complicated than that, uh, but uh, what it all comes down to is that these researchers, they develop an interesting tool called LTE Inspector, which allows them to not only test LTE networks for flaws, but also to actually then conduct the attack. Pretty interesting paper if you are into any kind of wireless audits and such. So for all the details, please refer to the paper that's linked in the show notes. Well, that's it for today. But before I let you go, I do want to propose another little contest to get rid of another Raspberry Pi. Now, learning a little bit from what I did in January, I want to modify things a bit. And this time it will be sort of every month I'll be giving away one Raspberry Pi. One of the problems I had uh, with sort of the corrections and such was trying to keep track who send in corrections. So what we'll do is I'll just consider those uh, corrections, comments and such that are posted to the actual podcast page. You should be able to leave a comment there. Now you will have to log in to do so. Secondly, I'll be giving away one Raspberry Pi a month, not five like I did in January, but it will be every month. That'll make things a little bit easier with actually mailing them out. In January, I was pretty much limited to mailing them to US addresses. I'll make it a little bit more international uh, this time around. The condition is that there has to be a website, preferably Amazon or so available in your country that allows me to order the Raspberry Pi and have it uh, mailed to you. Well, uh, that's it. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.